Well, welcome tonight. My Horse University and Equa Network would like to welcome you and are excited to offer horse enthusiasts a science-based fun series of courses on horse breeding and selection, which also are coupled with the four live web presentations. This is the third live web presentation of the series. Dr. Kathy Anderson from University of Nebraska will be presenting Preparing and Breeding Your Mare. Dr. Anderson has been the Extension Horse Specialist at the University of Nebraska since 1991. She oversees the Youth and Adult Extension programs. Kathy also teaches courses in horse management, equine re reproduction, and equine nutrition. She's an avid horse show judge, and she is a carded judge with the American Quarter Horse Association, American Paint Horse Association, and she's, she's also received her Bachelor of Science in Animal Science and Agriculture Education from the University of Nebraska. She has a Master's as well from Texas A&M University and a PhD from Kansas State University. <coughs> Kathy also stays involved with the industry. She previously was an assistant trainer and breeding manager at a large quarter horse farm. Her family currently raises and shows Western pleasure horses. She is also involved with Extension's Horse Quest Project we would also like to thank our sponsors, Purina Mills, Horse Tech, and Iron Spring Farms for sponsoring this series. Please feel free to ask questions pertaining to the slides during the presentation. We will also have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Please welcome Dr. Kathy Anderson. Okay, hello everybody. Oops. Okay, hello everybody, and I think that I'm on where you can um, hear me now. And uh, I'd like to also, again, uh, welcome you all to this evening's presentation. And sure, feel free to text in um, some other questions if you have as we do go through um, tonight's presentation. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. And at first, what I want to, to bring out and discuss just a little bit is about um, the topic or, or my subject for tonight is preparing and breeding your mare. And when you look at mares getting ready to be bred, there really are um, two groups of mare that, mares that you really do need to consider because they are some, they're similar, but they are somewhat different. So we have mares that are either open or barren. Okay, those are mares that have maybe either never been um, bred before, or they maybe have had foals previously, but no foals um, in the current year and they're not pregnant. Then the other group of mares that you really do need to consider are them that are pregnant. Um, have been pregnant and are lactating because as you know that mares um, their gestation length is just about 11 and a half months long and so in contrast to some of our other livestock species we're going to be breeding these mares at the same time that they're lactating and so we have to understand some of the kinds of things that they're going through to enable us to go ahead and, and get those mares to rebreed so we can have a foal with them each and every year. So the first area that we really do want to, to discuss and talk a little bit about um, is some of the nutrition aspects um, in regards to how getting your mares to cycle and, and be rebred. And so to address first your mares that would be the open or barren mares, um, these might be young mares that have never been bred before, uh, mares that you might also at the same time be riding or campaigning, or they might be mares that for whatever reason the previous year they did not have a foal, and so you're trying to rebreed them th this next year. But th we know that the nutritional base of these mares is very, very critical to help enable them to go ahead and cycle and thus spend less time at the breeding farm or however you might be breeding them to enable them to go ahead and get and settled as quickly as we can. So your mares, if they're open and barren mares, um, if they're, they've been bred, okay, we're going to pick up from the standpoint that these mares are bred and we're going to getting them either, well really on two sides of the fence, we're either looking at these mares just getting them ready to be bred or they might be mares that are bred and going to go ahead and foal this year. So in the early portion of their gestation, okay, in the early first two trimesters, okay, first two thirds of gestation, or um, those mares really are just need to be bred or fed similar to a horse at maintenance. Um, the foal, if they are pregnant, inside them is only growing very small amounts. Uh, they really primarily their nutritional needs are just there to help them and keep them in good body condition. If you have a mare that is um, not bred and you're looking to bring that mare into the breeding season or, or breeder, this is really pretty much the kind of the nutritional plan that those mares would need to be on at that same time. 
We'll talk a little bit and address body condition here in a minute. And basically, the only time you would need to feed these mares above what the maintenance requirement would be would be if they're a little bit on the thin side and you want to increase their body condition to help them go ahead and cycle a little bit better. And we'll address that a little bit as we get into uh, talking a little bit about body condition and how it affects how well those mares are going to breed and cycle. But to give you a few guidelines on these mares that um, are in earlier mid gestation or your open mares as you're looking to go ahead and breed them, basically with those horses they need about one and a half to one percent of their body weight in feed. And um, that's a good guideline to look at and really that could be met by e either feeding them a hundred percent forage diet or somewhere at seventy five percent to a hundred percent forage. So those horses might be maintained on a good quality pasture or they might need a small amount of grain, zero to twenty five percent of their body weight or zero to twenty five percent of this amount could be grain, kind of depending on their body condition, where they're housed and those types of things. An important thing also to remember is that those mares really do need, at least in all horses need, a minimum of 1% of their body weight in forage, which is really important to realize and remember if those horses are kept in confinement, say in stalls or in dry lots. So to give you an idea how much feed that actually is, I usually use a 1,000 pound mare that's kind of an average stock horse um, size it's always easy to calculate in your head working off of a thousand pound horse and we'll have horses that are bigger and smaller but these horses would need somewhere between a total of 15 to 10 pounds total pounds of feed um, which could be all in gra all in hay, all in forage, all in pasture around if it's hay that you're feeding them 11 to 12 to 15 pounds of hay or if you're supplementing them with a little bit of grain about just about a um, little over, a little under uh, four pounds of grain, or you know they might not eat any grain at all, and that's pretty basic for those horses in early to mid gestation, or those horses that are in good body condition that you are preparing them and getting them ready to be bred if they don't have a foal on the side. Some things to think about if those horses are out on grazing, they might consume as much as 3% of their body weight a day in a good high quality pasture, which is certainly a nice way to have those horses. However, not everybody is always um, has access to a lot of pasture, so therefore if they are in dry lots and stalls, again, you need to give them at least 1% of their body weight in, in roughage, so they might consume up to 1.5 to 1.75% of their body weight in, in forages. And then on the concentrate feed on your grain ration, um, something like about a 10% crude protein grain ration up to about a 12% for these mature horses at this stage is probably very sufficient and they really unless they're in thin condition don't need too much grain and your horse will more or less let you know that uh, depending on what kind of body condition they seem to stay in and that pretty much can hold those horses through early and mid gestation again your open mare that she's coming in to be um, bred for the first time those are also some good guidelines for that horse now, in all of these horses, pregnant, uh, in all of these horses, when you reach into the last third of gestation, the last three months, then that fetus inside them is growing at a much rap more rapid rate. They're gaining almost as much as a pound a day in utero, okay? And so by the tenth month of gestation, they really are getting the largest amount of re mineral retention by that developing fetus, meaning that they're starting to develop more of those bones and all those types of things. So our nutritional um, makeup of our diet for mares in the last three months of gestation is really, really very critical. Now, you might not have to, to change the total pounds that you're feeding. However, some of the concentration of your protein, energy, minerals may need to be enhanced, may need to be changed. Um, if your horses have been out on pasture, you have to realize that at this time of year, for many of us, um, our pastures might be just beginning rejuvenated. Um, many of them have been dormant throughout the winter months. And so for those horses, um, they're going to need some supplementation of grain um, and making sure that it does contain a very uh, correct amount of protein, minerals, and energy to ensure that good fetal development. Okay. 
something else to think about your mares that are pregnant or lactating. And this is to realize kind of how much milk those mares actually would be producing, that they might produce as much as 3% of their body weight, okay? So some of those high producing um, mares, it could be somewhere as much as 30 pounds or four gallons of milk in a day. All right, so as these mares are getting ready to be bred, you have to realize that there's a lot of um, output of energy that's going on with those mares, and we have to ensure that they are in a good body condition because this generally is also the time that we're going to look to be rebreeding those mares. Okay, so an average mare might be producing as much as three gallons in a day, and then after about 90 days, that milk production will begin to fall off just a little bit. So your milking mares, um, and I realize this will seem like some large numbers, they might consume as much as 2 to 3% of their body weight in total feed in a day. And so that 1,000-pound mare might be consuming or could consume up to 20 to 30 pounds of total feed. Now, if she is um, grazing a high-quality pasture, then you might still need to supplement her to have her at the best, most optimum plane of nutrition of a small amount of grain. So again, 0.75 to 1.5% of her body weight in grain, or my simple example of our 1,000-pound horse of 7.5 to 12.5 pounds of grain. Now, I do know a lot of producers do have their, their um, pregnant mares, excuse me, their nursing mares out there on 100% pasture, and you certainly can do that. You just really want to watch and ensure that those mares are not losing any weight on you, that they are still maintaining good body condition, so you don't have any ne negative um, effects with them as you do try to go ahead and rebreed them. Now, if you're not fortunate enough to have a lot of pasture and those horses are in confinement, say in a dry lot, um, stall situation, or something like, something like those, or you might have horses that are just on a very average quality pasture, or the other group is you have mares that are just extremely heavy milking. Well, then naturally their groceries, their calorie output is going to be more, so those mares really are going to need probably some additional grain of about 1.75 to 2 and a half, that should, excuse me, 2.5% of their body weight in grain. So these mares might need as much as 17 to 20 pounds of grain and 15 to 20 pounds of hay. And I know that this sounds like a tremendous amount of grain. Um, to do it the best, you'll need to split that up into multiple feedings. But you also have to realize that these mares' calorie output is very, very high. And so um, you don't need to be too overly concerned about um, having to feed some of those mares um, what would seem to be a fairly high amount. Now, the reason that we do focus on nutrition of the mare so much is that we do know that there is a direct link of her body condition and how much fat cover she has in relation to how well she's going to cycle and how well she's going to breed back to you on you. So whether your mare is open and you're getting ready to breed her, particularly if she is pregnant and she's getting ready to fall, you need to watch and ensure that she is in a very good body condition. And I think that most folks can see that the horse on this side um, where you can see um, the poor guy's skeleton very very easily is certainly not the thrift uh, is certainly a very unthrifty horse and not where we would like any horses to be and the yellow mare over on this side we certainly would like more of them to be and I can guarantee you that the mare on the Palomina mare um, would rebreed much quicker and have much more um, much more desire reproductive efficiency than the mare would on this side okay. Now to talk just really briefly on condition scoring so you all have a good appreciation for it and um, in some other, their nutrition course here with My Horse University, they do go into this much, much more detail, but we'll just mention it a little bit here because it is very critical for the reproductive efficiency of our mares. And so we do condition score horses on a scale of 1 to 9 with 1 being extremely emaciated or skinny and 9 being um, very obese. The sore horse that I just showed, you can see the ribs, that horse would be somewhere maybe between a 1.5 and, and a 2. And we look at all these various different areas as you'll see over here when we condition score horses, looking at the amount of fat they have over their ribs, behind their shoulders, along their withers, their neck, their flank, and all those various areas. And just to show you how it is related to their reproductive efficiency, what has been found is that mares that are a condition score of five or below, and this mare on this side, I would consider her about a four and a half. She is below a five. 
they do have reduced reprodu reproductive performance and in increased embryonic loss, meaning that these mares, um, as you will see, that maybe look like this with this kind of body condition. You can see her ribs and her backbone and those things somewhat prominent. Uh, these mares will tend to take longer to cycle. They will not um, cycle as, as, as quickly in the breeding into the season. Uh, they will not rebreed as quickly as mares if they are in a heavier body condition, and they also will have a greater likelihood that they will lose those pregnancies um, at a fairly early stage. In contrast to mares that are condition score or five or above, and this sorrel mare on this side, I would put her, um, oh, somewhere in a six or a seven. The other thing is you can condition score to somewhat off of just visual, but to do the best job is we would run our hands over this mare and really get a good feel for what her body condition really is. But the bottom line with our reproductive parameters is that mares in a condition score of five would basically have Im Im improved reproductive performance, meaning that they would cycle earlier in the year, take fewer cycles to become pregnant, their over pr overall pregnancy rate will be higher, and they will maintain those pregnancies to a greater degree than if they are a condition score of four or five or below. In addition, as far as concerns with our lactating mare, because you have to remember how much milk these mares are producing, and in addition, um, this is the same time that we are asking these mares to be rebred, so your lactating mares, if they're below a condition score of five, they may not cycle very well at all because they're using that energy that their energy reserves for milk production. They're still going to go ahead and produce that milk for their foals. They will shut down the reproductive function and not read back for you very well if they are in that lower condition score. On the flip side, if you've got some of the butter balls, some of the, the, the heavier types of mares, all right. In some work that has been done, they really found that we haven't seen any dystocia, which is really foaling difficulties. So there are no increase in that because those mares are in an obese condition. So things like, you know, bas basic things of mares having difficulty um, delivering their foals. In addition, for those obese mares, we really have not seen any rebreeding problems as related to their obese condition. But also, we did not see any reproductive advantage. They did not milk any better. Uh, they didn't rebreed any faster. And we know mares that are in this obese condition, one, are set up for a variety of other metabolic types of problems they could later ensue. And also, they are kind of a, a time bomb just waiting to happen. They will be more, tend to be more prone for laminitis and other kinds of, kinds of issues. And so, we really don't want to have those mares in an overly obese condition um, either. So the bottom line as far as condition score is considered is we would like though to have those mares, whether they're getting ready to foal or whether you're just getting them ready to be bred, of being in a condition score of a five and a half to a seven and a half, somewhere in that range. Excuse me. In this situation, these mares will tend to spend fewer days at the breeding farm or fewer days when you're trying to get them pregnant. Uh, basically fewer days being open and they will have an, be the economic optimum because um, things are going to progress a little bit more quickly if they are in that thinner body condition um, situation. All right, to move on now and to address another area that um, is very important with preparing your mare to be bred because we really do want her to be in the most optimum condition, the most optimum health situation as you're looking to get that mare bred. So some things as far as your health care, your general routine health care um, program for those horses, you need to think about them, you need to do a little bit of pre-planning. Um, in the time that you're going to be breeding those mares, most uh, reproductive specialists will really recommend that you need to do whatever you can to minimize stress, all right? So many veterinarians would prefer to do what they would consider elective types of procedures or elective types of care such as deworming, your routine vaccinations, your annual dental care, um, to try to do those not right at the time that you're actually going to be breeding that mare. So, for example, they would most rec would recommend that you might um, perform any of these elective types of things and routine things somewhere either three to four weeks before you're going to breed that mare or earlier, um, or on the other side, 
um, after she's 40 days in full, just so you're not putting excess stress and unnecessary stress on that mare at the time when you're actually trying to go ahead and get her bred. Also, it's good and it's a good recommendation to consult your local very your local veterinarian for what they recommend your routine vaccinations and deworming program should be. I know we have folks here from a variety of different locations and so um, you really need to see and check what's recommended for your local area as far as what, what they feel is, is most optimum. However, just to give you a few ideas of what really is what you might say a typical mare vaccination um, recommendations is most still will recommend that we vaccinate for rhinopneumonitis, um, the, the abortive form of rhinopneumonitis at the fifth, seventh, and nine month of gestation. Rhinopneumonitis, um, if mares come in contact with it, does call it, cause abortion in mares. And so it's very important that your mares are vaccinated and that they need to be vaccinated three times during gestation at the fifth, seventh, and nine month of gestation. And you need to use the killed type of vaccine that is um, specific for the abortive form of rhinopneumonitis. Now some of the other routine um, vaccinations that most often are recommended and uh, again, these should be done either after 40 days, after she's 40 days pregnant or three to four weeks prior to. Now, if your mares are gestating and would be foaling, then it is very strongly recommended that you give these vaccinations at least 30 days before she's due to foal because then it will allow the developing fetus, um, then it would, it would allow the foal, once it's delivered, to have some protection against these various um, diseases. The foal will, um, the, the, there will be some immunoglobins or some antibodies developed in the mare's um, milk in her colostrum that will allow some protection against these diseases from that foal when it's first born. So most of the routine ones would be sleeping sickness or your equine encephalomyelitis and depending on the part of the country you are, there are various strains. So you knew, do need to find out um, what is recommended in your area. Equine influenza or flu, most recommend that. Tetanus is pretty much a routine that most horses do need a, a booster for it. Most areas also do recommend for West Nile virus and additionally more areas are also recommending that you do vaccinate your horses for rabies. But again, I feel it's important that you do contact your local practitioner um, for what their recommendations are for your specific area. All right. Now we've gone through some of the nutrition and health care and we've talked about um, some nutrition and health care. So really uh, to get in a little bit more about looking and seeing if your mares really are cycling, that's very, very important and you understand how a horse really does cycle. And so they're characterized by what we call the seasonal polyesterous breeder. Well, what in the world does that mean? That means that their cycle it follows the seasons and for horses they are driven by day length. Okay. Polyesterous means that once she is in her breeding season, she'll have multiple heat cycles throughout that season. Okay, to understand this, our horses really are driven by day length, and they are day long day breeders, meaning that as the day length increases, those horse, our horses will begin to cycle. Mother Nature allows most animals to have their offspring in the spring when you're moving into the summer. And with a horse with about 11, 11 and a half months gestation length, left to nature, she will foal in the springtime. All right. So on this graph here, um, you can see in the summer months, um, depending on where you're at, you will have horse, your horses will come up and truly begin to cycle. Okay. When day length decreases, and we get more into the winter months, then her cyclicity, the amount of mares that are actually truly ovulating um, and that type of thing, they will decrease that. Most horses, their peak reproductive activity is going to be somewhere in May and mid-June and just realize that June 21st is the longest day of the year and December 21st is the shortest day of the year. And so they will go into what we consider the winter anestrus in the winter months and in the springtime begin to come up and cycle. Okay, so winter anestrus is, would be in this phase here where for most of us, many of our horses are in that phase right now where they are basically shut down in the winter months and their ovaries um, are very small and inactive and, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, if you tried to breed these mares, it's going to be pretty fr fruitile because they're not really cycling. Then for many of us, depending on where you are, however, getting into late February, March, and April, they will go through what we call the transitional phase. And as the day length begins to increase, as it is now, uh, those horses will begin to start to slowly have a resurgence, where if you see in our schematic here, their follicles or their ovaries will begin to become more functionally active. They will have be characterized by heat periods when they're in heat for very long periods of time. They might be in heat for as long as 10 days. If you palpate them, their follicles will develop, only they will regress. They will not actually go ahead and ovulate. If they are bred during this time, your conception rates are usually very low because they haven't really truly kicked in. They're not truly actually um, ovulating and cycling quite yet. Another outward indicator is that oftentimes these mares will begin to shed their winter hair coat. Um, you get excited when they're losing that hair in great big chunks, but during this transitional phase is when they also will tend to start slipping some of their winter hair coat. <clears throat> okay, uh, the other group of mares before we get into their true breeding season is to remember that for those mares that are foaling, okay, in the current year, they will have what we call a foal heat, okay? And so those mares will come in and have an actual true estrus period, an actual actual true um, heat cycle, somewhere typically between 10, 7, and 10 days after they, they have foaled. Most of these will have a fairly normal cycle, and then they will go ahead and continue to cycle th um, in, into the, you know, cycle um, unless they've been bred. Uh, it is some differences of opinion if those mares should be on full should be bred on full heat because remember this is a very short time after they've gone through the parturition process. However, some things to think about is and actually I would consult with your veterinarian or your breeding manager as far as their recommendations. You want to be cognizant of the type of parturition that they had. Was it easy? Was it simple? Um, did they have a very difficult birth? All those are questions to see and investigate. Did they retain their placenta? So some of those might have ne very negative effects if you should breed those mares on full heat. Uh, time of the year is also probably one of the biggest factors. If it is late in the breeding season, say in July, uh, then oftentimes that is when many individuals will go ahead and decide to breed those mares on full heat so they can go ahead and shorten that interval up. Remember, if you breed that mare on full heat, she will have that full approximately three weeks earlier than what she did in the current year. So if those mares are already foaling, say in March or early in the year, then you might not determine or might not need to breed them on full heat. But most of the time if a mare is late foaling, then the consideration of, full, of breeding on full heat comes into play. In addition, the condition of the mare. Her condition score um, is a factor and also um, how well, again, going back to the type of parturition and that that she had. So those are all questions to address and, and things to think about if you may want to breed on a mare on full heat. Then you can work with um, whomever's helping you breed those mares because there are some, um, some procedures and things that can be done with those mares to help them get in full and maintain those pregnancies. All right, so once our horses kick in to their typical breeding season, uh, what that basically is, is typically it's in late spring and early to midsummer. So depending on where you are in the United States, it might be late March, early April. Um, for us in Nebraska, it typically is around mid-April. So it will vary a little bit as you move north and south in, in the United States. But once they kick into their true breeding season, it typically lasts about 21 days. Okay, as you can see here over here on this schematic, it's going to last about a 21 day period on the average and all horses will be just a little bit different. Estrus, or the period where she's in heat and can be bred in this purple area here, on the average is going to last somewhere between four to five days. A few mares might last longer, some mares might last shorter. This is the time when those mares will show, the time, show that she's in heat, her follicles will grow somewhere between 30 to 50 millimeters in size. Um, the nice thing, it might vary from horse to horse, but a particular mare will tend to be fairly consistent amongst herself. And so if you know she always ovulates a 50 millimeter follicle, you'll know when that mare actually truly needs to be bred. 
Another important factor with our breeding our horses is to understand and realize that they will ovulate somewhere between 24 and 48 hours before they stop showing heat, before they stop, they go out of, of estrus, uh, become unreceptive to the stallion. So we need to breed those mares while they are still in heat, while they are still showing estrus, all right? If we know if we breed those mares after they've gone out of heat, chances of pregnancy are pretty much nil, pretty unlikely that it's going to happen. All right, just to talk a little bit more about her typical cycle for all the lingo that we'll use, that we do use, the period after she's ovulated until she comes back into heat the next time through here is considered the diestrous period, okay? This is when she's not receptive to the stallion. Um, we'll talk a little bit about cycle manipulation. This is when um, she's under the function of a corpus luteum and under the, the, the influence of progesterone, all right? This is also when her uterus is being prepared for pregnancy if she has been bred. If she's not been bred, um, she will, though progesterone will still be elevated and she will be um, unreceptive to the stallion during that diestrous period. On the average, remember, her cycle is about 21 days. Um, most mares, as I mentioned, will tend to be fairly consistent amongst themselves. And so uh, you know if your mare has an 18-day cycle, that's what she does. And so it's very important that you keep very good records on her so you know what is typical for that particular mare. <clears throat> so that's when she kicks into her true breeding season. And then, <clears throat> in addition, they will go back into what we call the fall transitional phase where it happens sometime in late summer, um, August, September, sometime in early fall. It is somewhat similar to that spring transitional phase where their ovaries do become small, their conception rate is fairly low. However, don't think that you're safe during the transitional phases or even the anestrous phase to go ahead and kick all your open mares out with any stallion because we all know that, that, that funny things can happen and a mare might go ahead and ovulate that you weren't expecting. So unless you're prepared to ha have a foal, um, you really do need to keep them separated. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, many of you might be thinking, and we do know, and you see that folks do have foals um, in the uh, in at various times during the year. Left to nature, um, most of our mares are going to be bred in late April and May. So many of them would be foaling in March, April, some of that time frame. Naturally, we have some foaling later than that. But we do know that a lot of folks or some individuals do choose to have their foals earlier in the year uh, for various management reasons, for various sale or competition reasons. And what they're doing there is because the mare cycle is patterned off a day length, then we can use what we call a fancy phrase artificial photostimulation, basically put those mares under lights so the mares think that it's springtime when it's still wintertime. And so what we're really doing is we're stimulating um, or simulating natural long day photo period when it's still in the winter. And the basic program that's used is that those mares need to perceive or see 16 hours of light and 8 hours of darkness. You'll hear various other programs, but this is really pretty much a standard one that's used um, across the industry. Most of the light um, can be added at the end of the day, has been found to work just fine. You really do not need to gradually increase the amount of light. Um, just if you um, have the lights turned on uh, for, or they can see the light really for 16 hours of light. And really what we know is critical is that they see that eight hours of darkness interrupted with the light. But so basically um, they should see light from somewhere around six in the morning till 10 at night. If you have a fairly lit um, barn or area, many folks will simply turn the lights on starting about 5 or 6 in the afternoon and keep them on into the evening. What's really recommended and probably really um, uh, is best is that you have your, your um, barn set up on some type of um, automatic timers so that no one wants to be sure that they're going to get out there every night, twice and twice a day, to get those lights turned on and turned off. So an automatic timer is really what is, is suggested and what would work the best. The thing that you have to realize is that it's not magic. You can't put those horses under light today and tomorrow they'll begin to cycle. Okay, Just like your natural horse, um, the, the day length will gradually increase and that will naturally bring them 
bring them out of their winter anestrous time through that transitional phase. So what we know is that um, it takes about a total of uh, three months to bring those horses out of the anestrous phase into their cycling season. So really with the lighting program, um, the lights for most programs will be turned on sometime in November or to the 1st of December. What you can expect is that within approximately 60 days, those horses will go through what we call the transitional phase, meaning that they will begin to start slip their hair a little bit. They will have um, go through. Uh, we'll have the long erratic heat periods. If you check their ovaries, they will um, come up and be uh, start to cycle um, or start to have functional. Um, follicles on them but not truly ovulate and then approximately 30 days later they will go ahead and actually truly go into their cycling season where they will truly go ahead and ovulate um, and, and have a more normal estrus period. What really is very important is that you keep the lights turned on to these horses um, until they are safe and full to make sure that for whatever reason they don't perceive daylight, daylight has gotten shorter and they, you do not want them to go back into the anestrous period for you. So the question is how much light do you need? Um, the research says three foot candles and like not everyone can understand or realize um, what three foot candles really are. So the basic guideline is that if you can have, um, as we see up here, be able to stand in the darkest corner of the area and go ahead and read a newspaper, then you will have enough enough light. Okay? It might be a 200 watt bulb in a stall. It might be overhead um, fluorescent lights. It really does not matter the type of light um, that it is. It's just that they do perceive that light for 16 hours and then it is shut off for 8 hours. Also, um, this can be with a group of mares. You will go to some large breeding farms and they're not going to bring all these horses into stalls. Um, one, they don't have room for them and who wants to have to clean stalls on all those horses? So uh, you can bring them into an indoor arena. You can bring them into an outdoor pen that just has a dry lot or an arena that has overhead lighting and that will take care of putting those horses under lights. The other thing you have to understand and realize, depending on your geographic region, is that as these horses come out of their winter and estrus through that transitional phase, they will begin to shed their winter hair coat. So if you are in the cold climates, um, the northern areas, you have to be able to house those horses and blanket them because they might be shedding and, and fairly well shed off in February or, or early March when you still have, do have some fairly cold climates. Okay, those of you involved in the horse show industry, this is a similar program that's used on those show horses um, to maintain those slick hair coats over the winter months. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so you have to realize and think that that because you are interrupting Mother Nature and you are taking her out of her natural situation, then you're putting yourself under a lot more management and things that you need to do to ensure that those horses, one, uh, uh, that the program continues and that you can house and maintain those horses um, correctly. So the thing you have to realize is if there would be any change in the lighting program, uh, the lights burn out, the timer goes off, and I don't think one night is going to affect them to any great degree, but if you have four or five nights in a row or a week in a row that the lights are turned off, then those horses are going to think that the days have become shorter. Okay, So what happens is they will begin to go anestrous on you. They will begin to shut down. Uh, you'll notice that their hair coat will typically change and their hair coat will typically um, start to fuzz up again. And the negative, most negative thing is it might, it could potentially take several months before those horses come in and do cycle again. So it's very, very important that you keep those mares under lights until they are safe and full, which most will consider at least 40 days in full, um, that they are safe and full before you take them off the lighting program. In addition, for your mares that are falling, so the previous year you had those mares under lights. So you have mares that might be falling in February, all right? 
One thing, two things you need to consider is number one, is that mare, if you're in the cold climates, might be delivering that foal in not the best of um, environmental conditions for a foal or mare, because those mares too will tend to shed off. So you need to be able to manage those foals in cold climates, um, keep them out of the elements. Then in addition, the other recommendation on mares that would be foaling in those early times is that you do place those mares under lights and then go ahead and do rebreed them. If you shut the lights off of them, they will perceive that the days are short and will go ahead and go <coughs> and estrus on you and you might be several months before they go ahead and come, come in and cycle again. So those are some things to consider um, if you're putting those mares under lights and using mares in a lighting program. <coughs> um, there are various other ways that you can manipulate a mare cycle and we'll mention a few of them but it's really important that you understand a lot of how the mare cycle works and how she functions, functions so you can know um, when things can be given and how and, and when and why some things might be given to manipulate her cycle. So unless you're very experienced in equine reproduction Consulting with a veterinarian that, that specializes in equine reproduction, also consulting with an experienced breeding manager can really help steer you down the, a road um, more correctly if you do need to, do, to use some various hormonal therapies on a mare, either to get her bred at a more optimum time or to uh, go ahead and keep that mare in full because you do have a variety of options out there. To talk about just a few that are very um, frequently used out there within the industry. Prostaglandins is one that is used um, a fair amount. And I'll walk you through her cycle again over here with an additional schematic to help you understand a little bit about the when and the why uh, some of these um, uh, hormonal therapies might be given to the mare. So remember during the period of estrus here is when she's in heat. During the period of diestrus is when she's out of heat. So the purple is when we would be breeding her, the blue is not. This coincides with our chart up here where you can see on our little over here is when she's ovulating. Uh, to understand the dynamics of what goes on in the horse, well, after she's ovulated on the ovary a, f a, a structure is developed called the corpus luteum. Now back here with when she's um, in heat and our big yellow follicle, when she's in heat, there's estrogen that's produced off of this follicle that makes her come into heat and shows all those behavioral signs and allows her to be bred. When she ovulates, then this corpus luteum is developed and it comes up and is developed very quickly after she's ovulated, but it's not fully functional until about four or five days after she's ovulated, which is here, and it's this corpus luteum that comes up and produces the progesterone that either allows her or maintains her pregnancy or keeps her out of heat until the cycle starts itself over again. All right. Now, another thing to understand and realize is there is another compound that's naturally produced from the uterus called prostaglandin F2-alpha that actually, if the mare um, is not pregnant, it is released from the uterus knocks out the corpus luteum and then allows that mare's cycle to go ahead and, and reoccur so she continues to cycle again so she can be bred on the next cycle. So prostaglandin is a compound that is often used in the horse um, to do different things to basically it does it can be an injection that will mimic what is done naturally to her where it will knock out the corpus luteum and knock out the source of progesterone and have that horse come back into heat. Okay, Given at the correct stage, if the injection of prostaglandin is given, she will come back into heat typically within three to four days and have a normal estrous cycle. <coughs> Just a come in, Michael. And have a normal estrous cycle. Sorry about that. Uh, what is critical is that the shot of prostaglandin has to be given at the, nor at the correct stage. So this corpus luteum here needs to be come up and be functional and mature for the shot of prostaglandin to work. So typically prostaglandin is given somewhere around the fifth day after she's ovulated, maybe the fourth if you've been able to palpate her and check her and can pinpoint ovulation very, very good. Okay. 
um, if it is given at an earlier stage, you're not going to get the benefits of the, of the shot because uh, you will have no effect because the corpus luteum is not functional. There's nothing for it to work on. So you can give a shot of prostaglandin out here somewhere in this time frame, probably up till about, oh, maybe the, around the 10th day and get that mare to go ahead and come back into heat. However, if you notice out here starting about the 10th or 11th day, you can give her that shot of prostaglandin, but if she is not pregnant, it's going to be naturally released anyway and knock out that corpus luteum. So we will get phone calls that we want to be able to give that horse a shot to bring her back into heat and I want to give it to her today. Well, if you get lucky and can give it to her in the correct days, then you're going to have the benefit from it. However, giving it at the wrong time, it's probably not going to have any negative effects. However, you're going, not going to have the benefit of uh, the function of, of the prostaglandin and have that mare come into heat. So it's important to know and understand where that mare is in her cycle uh, so you can go ahead and get the benefit from using the prostaglandin. Uh, the most common compound used is a, is a, a drug called Lutalyse. Um, it's also what's used in various other species. Uh, a few of the um, side effects of prostaglandin is in the natural occurring it does cause smooth muscles contractions so when you give an injection of lutealize some mares will sweat or show colic like symptoms um, they don't generally go ahead and truly colic but it will stimulate smooth muscle contractions so these are some of the outward signs you may see, see. however the degree or severity of these outward signs does not mean that it worked better on one horse than another it just means that one's going to react a little bit different than the other so when is this compound typically given? It's given to short cycle mares, so maybe um, it's a mare that you did not want to breed, but you don't want to wait till her whole cycle next to bring her back. So you let her go through her heat period and five, six days later, you bring her back into heat. Um, full heat mares, that's a lot where it's used, where you did not breed that mare on her full heat. However, uh, you want to allow for a little bit more time for the uterus to involute and those types of things. So you will let her go out of heat um, and then give her a shot of prostaglandin to bring her back in. Sometimes, occasionally, you have a mare that has a persistent corpus luteum. She's not pregnant, but she doesn't come back into heat, so prostaglandin can be given on those types of mares. Occasionally, you've had a problem where a mare and a stallion got out together, and you can use a prostaglandin to go ahead um, in an, to, to abort an early pregnancy if it's needed. Another compound that is used quite often is called HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin. And the reason I have LH here is because it is, works similar to the natural, natural occurring LH um, in the horse. And so back to our schematic over here, to show you uh, another hormone that comes into play, you can see here with our follicle that's ovulating, LH comes in here just before ovulation and it increases or surges uh, and it is important for the follicle to finally do the final maturation of it and also it's critical to stimulate ovulation to occur. So we can use a compound called HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin that works like LH to go ahead and stimulate that mare to go ahead and ovulate. Now, again, similar to, L, similar to um, prostaglandin, it needs to be given at the correct stage. Uh, to work most effectively, the mare should have a follicle that's somewhere between 30 to 35 millimeters in size. If she has a follicle that, that is of that size, you give her the injection of HCG, she should ovulate somewhere between 36 and 48 hours after she's ovulated. In addition, it's important to know um, that the best pregnancy rates come with it inseminating three days before or up to six days after she's ovulated. So you can use the HCG to help to pinpoint in time when you might be inseminating these mares and it's more often used anymore if people are breeding with cooled semen or frozen semen because uh, they're trying to pinpoint ovulation. It's also important to realize that if, if you inseminate her 30 days after ovulation, You've kind of wasted your time and it's highly unlikely that pregnancy is going to occur. Now something else to realize and, and understand about HCG is some horses may develop what we call antibodies against it. If you use it on a mare one cycle, she doesn't get in full, you need to use it off over repetitive cycles. Over time it might not um, work 
uh, to the degree that it did initially. Cost is not too, ex too expensive, somewhere between $15 and $25 a dose. And it is one that is, you'll see used in the industry quite a bit. Now, there are various other um, therapies out there. Um, there are implants that are placed in the ho both the horse's neck to keep them out of heat. There are implants that are placed in the vulva uh, to help stimulate ovulation. Uh, there's various other hormone therapies that are used with progesterone, both um, injectable and oral, and a variety of different things that can be used um, with your horses depending on what needs to be done um, and what's going to be recommended the best. Again, I always suggest that you do um, work with an experienced veterinarian uh, that is uh, knows quite a bit about reproduction or a good breeding manager because generally left to nature you're going to have your best chances of, of success with breeding mares in pregnancy. And so we don't want to get into using and thinking that we can inject them and give them things too often. Um, mainly. Uh, sometimes these can be aids, particularly with use of progesterone in mares to help maintain their pregnancies. But again, you need to have someone experienced to help you along to learn when you should or should not be using some things. Some other things to understand and, and realize and think about that might be options out there to use, um, depending if you're having problems breeding your mare, uh, depending on the method that might be, be used. Rectal palpation is frequently used where basically your veterinarian will go in through the rectum and palpate her, her cervix, her vagina, her uterus, the ovaries, and get a good feel for um, what the tone is, can get a good feel for what the health of her uterus and, and, and reproductive structures might be. Ultrasound examination, this is ultrasound of a mare's ovaries over here, is used pretty extensively in the horse. We can ultrasound her ovaries to see what type of follicles she has, which can also be felt by good rectal palpation. Ultrasound can also look for the health of the uterus. It's used um, uh, quite extensively for pregnancy diagnosis. So any veterinarian that's doing very much reproductive work should be doing ultrasound, um, both of the ovaries and the uterus, um, to look for how they're functioning, how they're working, health of them, and those types of things. A couple other diagnostic tools that your veterinarian might recommend, particularly if you're having trouble getting a mare in full or maintaining her pregnancy, is a uterine culture, which is basically a swab of the endometrial lining to pick up and determine different kinds of infections and pathogens that might be in there. In addition, an endometrial biopsy, which is taking pieces of her uterine lining and analyzing that to also help determine what type of environment it ha she might have, what the health might be. So those are all various types of um, tests that can be done on your horse. And many of them, if your mare is good and simple and she gets bred right away, then it's very nice because then you don't have to um, worry about those things. But many of them will come into play, particularly if you begin to have problems. Um, most of your breeding contracts now will require that the mare is ultrasounded to determine pregnancy because they also want to ensure that she does not have twins in her um, because twins in horses is really pretty much a negative thing. So to kind of bring things to the close here, um, we've kind of really just just hit the tip of the iceberg and given you some, some general guidelines and things about getting your mare ready to be bred from nutrition and health, help you understand how she might cycle so you understand when she could be bred and those types of things. And it really is important that you do educate yourself, um, visit with other folks that are good in the reproductive practices of their horses, learn about your different options and those types of things. Also to start planning early. I mean, if you think you want to put your horse under lights, you know that um, here the 1st of February, you're probably a little bit behind for the current year. Um, so plan early. Um, you want to make sure that they're in a good nutritional state, that their health care is done, because the better shape that they are entering the breeding season, then the more economic it will be for you, um, hopefully because they'll get bred right away and things will go very nice and simple and straightforward. You need to consider when you want those mares bred and more importantly, when you want those foals to be born. Are you going to let them go through the natural season, which still a majority of, of horses um, are bred just following the natural season, or for various um, marketing, campaigning reasons, do you want those foals very early in the year?
Okay. Something that we didn't get to very far in this evening's session um, is the method of breeding. There are a variety of additional options out there um, between using some of the processed semen of frozen and cooled semen. Artificial insemination is very widespread. However, don't cut out and think that um, nobody pasture breeds. There are a lot of uh, farms that still turn mares and stallions out together and pasture breed uh, through various associations. So it's the jockey club. They still have to live cover. So there are a lot of varieties of, of ways that mares are being bred. And if you start shopping around a stallion or shopping around a farm, you need to consider and think about and find out what some of those options actually might be. So with that, um, I've pretty much taken most of your time for this evening. And again, I hope that you've gotten um, some good information and gotten some good ideas. And again, if any of you have um, some more, any questions or anything about anything I've talked about or things just in general with trying to, to get your mares um, ready to be bred, go ahead and, and take a moment and type those in, and I'll try to respond back to them um, as best I can. And if you don't have any, I, I hope that I um, got you some good information and um, appreciate uh, you guys sitting in here this evening. Here's a question on, do you recommend uh, to breed your mare in the full heat if everything has been good and she's in good health, body condition, or wait till better evolution of the uterus? My biggest recommendation on that is also partially time of the year. If it's July and I want that mare to have a foal a little bit earlier, then yes, I would breed her on foal heat if everything went well. One um, therapy that also I would recommend is that you have a uterine lavage performed on her um, in which that you um, that they go in and pretty much flush your uterus out. They will run fluid in, saline in and out, and it helps to clean that uterus out and helps involute that uterus. And so any time a mare would be considered to be bred on full heat, um, that's a procedure that I'd suggest that would be done um, to help improve uterine involution. And the main reason for me to, me to breed on full heat is if it's late in the year and you need that mare to have that full just a little bit earlier. Okay, so I hope that um, that helps you out. What is actually um, Regimate? Okay, Re Regimate is an oral progesterone. Um, it's an oil based, and I think that's what you're um, asking. And Regimate, um, it's an oral progesterone. There, so it's going to go in and and simulate the what the natural progesterone would do for your mare. So it will be used for a variety of different things depending on what your needs are. Regimate is often used on mares that need to be, maintain a pregnancy. Um, some mares lose a pregnancy around 40 days, and so they will place those mares and give those mares Regimate because it's an oral progesterone to help them maintain their pregnancies. It's used sometimes to synchronize groups of mares. Um, it is also used at times to take mares out of heat. If it's a show mare, you don't want her to show estrus, show heat, then it will be used to take those mares out of heat also. And so the problem, the one downside with Regimate is it's an oral that is given each day to that horse, but that's the primary use is for her. Um, when should the uterus lavage should be done? Typically it's done very um, in the next few days after she's foaled. Um, usually the second or third and maybe, you know, done more than one time is when um, the uterine lavage has actually been done. Usually about the second or third day after she's foaled um, and then maybe a few days just depending on, on the condition and how things were when it came out, when of, of what the fluid is and how she was. Um, I was just looking back to see if there were any. How long would you keep a mare on Regimate to maintain a pregnancy? Typically, it's pretty much suggested that she's on it out about 180 days of pregnancy. Um, it's when the, the, the source of progesterone changes. Um, and so it's out a fairly long time, but it doesn't need to be maintained the entire time. Um, and so that's kind of a, a rough guideline of what is used. Um, this question is, if a mare is on supplements for mild arthritis, should you cons continue these supplements or cur curtail them once she is bred? 
I think you want to keep those horses as as comfortable and stress free as, as you as you want them to be. And I mean, it might depend a little bit what the supplements are, but most of those are going to be um, the type of thing that I don't think are going to have many negative effects on reproductive on a reproductive function. And so I would be more concerned that that mare would get stressed um, and sore and have other problems with carrying that pregnancy. And so I would be inclined to go ahead and, and maintain her on, um, you know, what those supplements would be to keep her minimize stress, keep her comfortable, um, because she's going to have more and more stress over those joints and limbs as she gets heavier and heavier and full. And so you sure want to keep them as comfortable as what you can. Oh. Let's see, recommendations for a mare that has good hooves when she's not pregnant but starts having hoof issues after she's three to four months um, pregnant. Um, that's an interesting one. I, I'd kind of look, you know, to make sure that your um, entire mineral makeup of your diet is good. It, it's, it's. Um, I'm not sure if she's, if it's more of a mineral that her feet are getting brittle or it's from the weight of the pregnancy. Um, that one I'm, I'm not real sure on. Um, you know, one supplement that we have found for horses that does help with the integrity of their hooves is to have them on some biotin. It ha can help with the strength of their hooves and those types of things. So that might be an idea, and it should not have any negative um, effects if she's pregnant. So. Is it safe to give medications for arthritis when she's pregnant? Um, I think so. It probably just depends on what, what type of medication it is. Um, many times those are going to be some of your um, oh, chondroitin sulfates and glucosaminoglycans and those types of things. And um, as best I know, those, should, those shouldn't have a problem. Uh, some of the steroid hormonal types of things, sometimes those are ones that they like to avoid. So um, my best indication is that uh, you know with some of those types, arthritic types of things should be okay. Can a mare safely have dental work done using sedative types of drugs? Again, you want to avoid the window of time of early pregnancy. So if you're past 40 days of pregnant pregnancy, um, I would make sure that your veterinarian knows that she is in full. But then, yes, she should be safe to have dental work and be, be sedated um, so long as she's past that 40 days of pregnancy, just so you're not doing anything, um, you know, that might disrupt things you know, in that early time. Lots of good questions. This is good. Let's see. I have a mare that's 158 days on Regumate due to two abortions and lost foals. Um, would you recommend having another sonogram, meaning probably an ultrasound? Um, you know, that sure not, it, it would help to ensure, you know, know that she's, um, that fetus is still there and still alive. Uh, you know, sometimes when you've had different kind of problems, you're going to go ahead and, and hang on and maintain the, maintain them on um, the Regumate out longer. It's not going to hurt them anything to go ahead and maintain them. Um, so probably um, uh, having another sonogram is probably a little bit up to you, just more or less for information. Is twinning an age factor, a genetic factor? Twinning is a factor if some mares will go ahead and um, and uh, actually have um, multiple multiple um, multiple ovulations, and so I don't think it's much of an age factor. Um, I'm not really going to say it's it's a true genetic factor. Uh, you'll have a mare occasionally that will maybe tend to have multiple ovulations, um, whereas the next one won't. But I do not believe that they've really um, researched and found any true genetic link to a mare that tends to have twins over one that does not. Um, one last question here on your thoughts on West Nile virus vaccines and pregnancies. Heard it's not a good vaccine to give a pregnant mare. Okay, is that true? Um, that was something that came up and, and, and a lot of um, things that, that people were skeptical of when West Nile first came out. Uh, there has not been any documented true research that has shown negative effects of 
giving um, pregnant mares West Nile virus vaccine. Again, um, just as recommended with your other elective practices, we probably don't want to vaccinate them for West Nile or anything else during that time when you're actually breeding them. So you would either want to do it early, depend on where you're at, or after she's 40 days um, of pregnant. But as far as any any negative things, I heard a variety of different um, rumors of, of funky things happening back when West Nile first came out. But no, there's not been any documented research to see it show any negative effects. Um, one last one. <laughs> Okay, uh, any dewormers we should avoid during the breeding process? Um, again, mainly the same type of thing as far as we're going to avoid deworming those horses during that window of time that you're breeding them. And so uh, you're not going to deworm them right, uh, you know, in the week or a couple weeks right when you're breeding them. Um, so that's probably the main thing with the dewormers. Thank you again for attending this presentation, and if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email info at myhorseuniversity.com. You can also learn more by visiting our website at www.myhorseuniversity.com as well. And again, we'd like to thank the following sponsors, Purina Mills, Horse Tech, and Iron Spring Farms. Thank you, everyone.